previous lectures we have discussed about basic concepts and certain detailed techniques in the field of light microscopy. Now, as we have gone along, we have discussed all different concepts and certain techniques to create contrast for visualization and light microscopy. If you could recall, we have gone through a uh, lot of different techniques where you require staining or you might re not require staining for visualization. Now, remember light microscopy has allowed us to view into the tiny world of cells, microorganisms, macromolecular assemblies and so on. It has allowed to which with the world tiny world which was totally unknown and unseen has been allowed uh, to be viewed by us with the advent of the light microscopy. But light microscopy has certain limitations. Now, limitation is due to the wavelength of the light which cannot be reduced. And so, because of the wavelength of the light, the limit of resolution is also limited. That is like we discussed earlier that you can only see or you can go up to say little better than 0.2 micrometer or 200 nanometer. So, details which require further higher resolution cannot be uh, seen in here. Now, this particular bottleneck could be for some what could be solved by utilizing little lower or you can say uh, wavelength with in ultraviolet region. But uh, this particular problem has been sorted out in electron microscopy. So, in the coming lectures, two lectures, we are going to discuss about uh, electron microscopy technique. And like light microscopy, the basic concepts, a lot of things might be similar, but there are uh, specific differences between light microscopy and electron microscopy. And we be, uh, will be dealing with those things as we go along in the electron microscopy section. So, let us start with this new technique which we are going to discuss today and in the next lecture that is electron microscopy. Now, microscopy technique, uh, this particular technique which is electron microscope technique is one where a beam of electrons is, is used for illuminating a specimen to generate a magnified image. Now, whereas in light microscopy, we used light to illuminate the specimen. Now, basic principles of electron microscopy are similar to light microscopy, but there are differences in terms of like say one major difference could be the lenses. In the light microscopy, if you could recall, there were glass lenses or optical lenses were used in the light microscopy. But in case of electron microscopy, electromagnetic lenses will be utilized and these are used in focusing a high velocity electron beam in place of visible light. Now, when we say electrons needs to be used here, then electrons cannot be, uh, the beam cannot be operated in the open condition. So, the entire tube containing the uh, different components of electron microscopy are, has to be maintained under a ultra high vacuum. So, this entire tube which contains the electron source, the, the lenses, the viewing screen, everything is enclosed chamber and therefore, because electrons are absorbed by atoms of air. So, this will be placed in a ultra high vacuum. Now, electron microscopes provides much greater resolution as I was talking that limit of resolution is a problem in light microscopy. You cannot go below a certain limit of resolution, but here in electron microscopy there will be much higher resolution could be achieved than light microscopy because the wavelength of the wavelength of electrons is almost 100,000 times shorter than visible light that is photons. Now, this effective resolution limit of electron microscope is considerably less than that of the th uh, uh, particular theoretical achievable resolution that is 0 0.005 nanometer. Now, this is because of the problem of spherical aberrations and because of this the electron focusing uh, lenses suffer 
and to solve this problem the NA of the lens is made very small from 0.01 to 0.001. So, you could see that theoretically light mic uh, the electron microscope can give you much higher resolutions, but because of certain spherical and other problems their resolution is lowered, but still it is much much higher than what you can obtain or achieve from the light microscopy. Now, advanced electron microscope can achieve resolution which is better than 50 picometer or 0.5 angstrom at magnification of around uh, we can say 1 million x or more than that. So, resolution limit for light microscope if you could recall is 200 nanometer and useful magnification is below 2000 x. So, if you could see here that in light microscopy you cannot go beyond a certain limit magnification, but here you can magnify the image even after obtaining from the objective lens manifold and this is because the amount of details which is available in a electron microscopy uh, image after objective lens is much much more and you benefit from magnification rather than blurring of the image or distortion of the image. Now, what is, uh, so these are all advantages which we were talking about the electron microscope, but one of the disadvantages of electron microscope is that, that only non-living samples can, can be observed as high vacuum conditions are required. Like I said, you have to have better than 10 raised to power minus 4 tor of the vacuum conditions. And so, when you have to maintain the vacuum conditions, living samples cannot be utilized. So, as we go along, we will be discussing about differences and also I will show you uh, how we can compare light microscope and an electron microscope. Now, in this section we are going to discuss about two main types of electron microscopy techniques and these are transmission electron microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. Now, transmission electron microscopy, the images are formed by the transmitted electrons and it provides you the internal details of the specimen. Uh, in contrast, scanning electron microscopy, here you rather than transmitted electrons, here backscattered electrons are used for image formation and here rather than internal uh, details, you look for or what you see is the surface details which are provided by scanning electron microscopy technique. Now, let us move on, what are different components of electron microscope? So, I will just introduce these things, then we will go in detail and discuss each of these components. Now, electron microscopes like I said, it has to be an enclosed chamber. So, it consists of a tall hollow cylindrical column within which the electron beam is confined and there is a console having dials for electronically controlling the operation of the microscope. Now, from the top to down, so here you have to remember that the uh, column contains the cathode emission source that is the emission source is at the top which is heated and acts as a source of electron. Now, if you could see, uh, if you could recall illumination source in the case of light microscopy was below that is at the base of the microscope and here it is at the top of the microscope. So, it is you can say the electron microscopes in comparison to light microscopes are upside down. Now, electrons are accelerated as a fine beam by the high voltage applied between cathode and anode in a high vacuum conditions in column and brought to focus by powerful electromagnetic lenses. So, these are different from optical lenses. Now, the size of the beam is controlled by various apertures and where condenser lenses focus the beam onto the specimen, a magnified image is formed by the objective which is further magnified many many times by the projector lenses or we call it in light microscopy ocular lenses. And finally, the image is uh, focused onto the viewing screen that is fluorescent screen and you can then see the screen directly or indirectly. So, this is these are the various components of uh, 
the electron microscope. Now, what are, uh, how do you uh, distinguish them? Let us see and then uh, we will be going in detail. First is illumination source or system. Now, illumination system is made of one is electron gun. What does electron gun do? It generates electrons and provides a coherent uh, electron beam here. Condenser lenses, there are two condenser lenses, one and two, which determines the smallest illumination spot size on a specimen and the, uh, the amount of illumination uh, in terms of intensity. Then there are condenser aperture, which reduces the spherical aberration and helps control the amount of illumination striking the specimen. So, illuminating system is made of electron gun, condenser lenses and condenser aperture. Now, specimen manipulation system or you can say specimen stage. Now, there are specimen exchanges and specimen stage, which is provided for moving specimen inside the column of microscope. Remember, microscope is uh, evacuated, there is a high vacuum conditions. So, there has to be a method to introduce your sample through an airlock system into the uh, column of the microscope. Then there is imaging system, which is after specimen, which is made up of intermediate apertures, objective lens and projector lenses. And these will focus the image onto the screen. And finally, the observation and uh, camera system here. So, there could be a viewing chamber, which contains viewing system uh, for final image and there could be camera, which could be utilized for recording the image. So, these are various components. Now, if you see this figure here, uh, then uh, this figure shows certain various components and you see that the source of electron is on top of the column which will be formed of cathode, anode and the apertures and these are condenser lenses here. Uh, label of specimen uh, is presented here, uh, where after the specimen there will be objective lens which is not written here and after objective lens there will be projector lenses, which will finally image or form the image onto the fluorescent screen. And this fluorescent screen you can see it directly or you can see it through binocular magnifiers. So, this is the electron microscope with various different components. Now, let us see how an electron microscope compares with light microscope. So, this is just to give you a feeling of the light microscope and electron microscope. Here we have just to align them, this is also upside down light microscope. Now, if you see here the light microscope lamp, which is a halogen lamp or certain uh, uh, for uh, the simple light and this is a filament, which is for producing electrons that is a cathode or filament for producing electrons. Now, lenses if you see these are glass or optical lenses, but here these are electromagnetic lenses. Likewise, so you have similar pattern here, condenser lenses there, which focuses or is a part of illumination system. Here condenser lens in electron microscope will focus the beam. Then you have a specimen place, where specimen will be placed. Uh, objective lens will take information from the specimen, like in light microscopy. These are the objective lens, again electromagnetic lenses. And then you have projector lenses, which is more than one in case of light mic uh, in the electron microscope. And finally, the image formation. So, you can say the basic arrangement is same, but kind of lenses which are used, kind of illumination which is used is different from light microscopy. All right. So, let us move on to uh, transmission. So, like we said, we are going to discuss two techniques here. One is uh, transmission electron microscopy, another is scanning electron microscopy. So, let us start with transmission electron microscopy. We also call it in short TAM. So, this particular technique or microscopy technique is one, where an image is generated from the interaction of electron beam transmitted through an ultra thin specimen. Now, the magnified image is focused onto an imaging device, which could be photographic film, a fluorescent screen 
or even a CCD camera. Now, TEM provides much greater resolution than the light microscopy as we were discussing, because the wavelength of electron is almost 100,000 times shorter than the visible light. Resolving power of this microscope that is TEM stems from the wave properties of electrons. So, what happens is that the wavelength of an electron is not a constant distance like we had in the light microscopy. Rather, it is related to the speed at which the particle is traveling, which in turn depends on accelerating voltage applied on microscopy. That is the potential difference or the voltage difference between cathode and anode. So, uh, it will uh, the speed of the electron will depend on that and the wave properties will depend on the accelerating voltage. So, uh, it is determined uh, the wavelength will be determined by square root of 150 by volts or V and which is uh, like you can calculate uh, as you know the accelerating voltage. Now, the standard transmission electron microscopes operate in the range which lies from 10,000 volt to 100,000 volts. At around 60,000 volt, the wavelength of an electron is approximately 0 0.05 angstrom. So, providing theoretically, if we can say an excellent limit of resolution, which could be almost 40,000 times better than the resolution of light microscopy. Now, problem like we, uh, I said, there are problems of spherical aberrations and other others. So, the effective resolution limit of electron microscope is considerably less because of these problems. Now, so the electron focusing lens will suffer and to avoid these numerical aperture is made very small. And so, now the effective resolution which could be achieved by the electron microscopes uh, is somewhere around 0.5 ang angstrom and magnification like I said more than million times magnification can be achieved without any problem. Now, let us get into the design and operation of transmission electron microscopes. Like we were discussing different components, let us little bit discuss them in detail. Illumination system, like I said, it consists of a source of electron called electron gun and a series of electromagnetic lenses. These are condenser lenses that focuses the initial electron beam onto the small spot on a specimen. Now, electromagnetic lenses like we were discussing, these are uh, constructed of soft iron core and these soft iron core wound uh, uh, with an electri uh, electrical conductor. So, this produces a magnetic field which is utilized to focus a beam of electron. Now, let us see what is an electron gun. Now, different components of electron gun includes one cathode. Now, cathode is also called emission source or, or filament and this is maintained at negative potential difference to anode almost like 50 to 100 kilo volt uh, negative potential difference. Uh, most common filaments used is thin tungsten wire bent into a V shape. So, that is the most um, uh, commonly used and uh, chief also, but there are other types which can give you better illumination or uh, fine focus. We, uh, these are lanthanum hexaboride LAB6 and field emission source. Now, lanthanum hexaboride filament is a pointed rod that provides a stable current from a small area than a simple tungsten filament. It is almost 10 times brighter than the tungsten filament and has a lifetime of 500 hours or longer, and, but it requires a vacuum in order of 10 raised to 1 minus 6 store or better. So, you would have to have better vacuum, but this is much better emission source as compared to simple tungsten filament. There is another better source than uh, your lanthanum hexaboride and simple tungsten filament that is called field emission source. You must have heard about field emission electron microscopes. Now, this requires a very high vacuum conditions like 10 raised to power minus 9 tor and it operates at room temperature. It requires a single crystal of tungsten 
with an emitting region of approximately 10 nanometer. Now, the brightness is almost 1000 times that of standard tungsten filament and it employs double anode. The first anode around 2000 volts extracts electron from tip and second anode accelerates electron down the column. It produces a very small probe size with negligible energy spreads. So, it is a very effective and very good source of electrons. So, you can say this is the best one of uh, best field uh, you can say emitter or filament here uh, emission source here, uh, but it is certainly will be more expensive as compared to a simple tungsten filament. Now, there is another component which needs a mention here that is called vinyl shield. Now, vinyl shield is positioned between cathode and anode and is held at potential difference of 100 to 200 volt negative to cathode. Remember, it is negative to cathode. So, what it does is the function is to create intense cloud of electrons in a very small uh, aperture and you can say it serves as an electron source. So, electrons from cathode uh, uh, like kind of collects in a intense cloud of electrons at this particular aperture. Vanilt shield is connected to high voltage and to filament heating voltage by resistors. And then there is the anode which directs the beam of electrons. Now, transmission el electron microscope will employ two condenser lenses uh, with an aperture, there will be an aperture of around 100 to 200 micrometer which is placed between the second lens and the specimen to reduce the spher spherical aberration. There will be deflection coils which are used to shift and tilt beam and these are part of illumination system. Now, let us see how does this looks like actually this is electron gun or emission source here. If you see this figure there are a lot of different electrical things power supply, variable registers, balancing registers, but what we are interested in cathode and anode. So, cathode is this simple V shaped tungsten filament which is when heated gives you electron and anode is here which because of there is a uh, potential difference the electrons will be rushed or directed towards the anode, uh, anode from cathode. Vanilt shield uh, condenses or you know makes an intense cloud here. So, this seems to be the electron source and then finally, the electrons are moved down the column through different lens system and through specimen to form the image. So, this is like a typical schematic of electron gun which is employed in the uh, electron microscopes. All right. Now, second part which is uh, after illumination system is the specimen carrier or specimen stage where specimen is placed. Now, transmission electron microscopes has two types of stages. Now, one is called top entry which utilizes a cartridge like specimen holder which is inserted into a stage from above. So, if you might have seen uh, simple printers actually where cartridge is inserted from above, it is something like that where it is a top entry stage. Then there is a side entry stage which utilizes a rod shaped specimen holder with one or two places for a specimen at one end. It is secured by clamp and spring mechanism. The rod is inserted into stage through an air lock on one side of the column. Like I said, it is a evacuated chamber and so it has to be prop, uh, inserted so that vacuum is not disturbed. Now, although top entry stage provides slightly better resolution as it fits better, but in TEM side entry stage is mostly utilized. It allows more versatility in positioning of the specimen and design of device for tilting a specimen is also very simple. So, this is much more convenient and more used in here. In TEM or transmission electron microscopy, the stage motion is limited to plus minus 1 millimeter in x y direction. And if there is a goniometer uh, fitted in the stage, then a specimen could be tilted up to plus minus 60 degrees. So, these are limited motions which can occur in the specimen carrier or specimen stage to uh, focus to place your specimen. 
after specimen stage comes the imaging system or optics which will form the final image. Now, this consists of objective lens, aperture, objective stigmators and projector lenses. So, uh, like light microscopy, the objective lens will collect or the beams will pass through the specimen and will be focused by objective lens. Objective lens will magnify the image uh, up to 100 x. The focal length of objective is very low around 2 millimeter, so that the specimen must be placed within the uh, concentrated magnetic field of the lens. Varying currents to objective lens permits focusing of image. Then projector lenses which could be 2 or 3, they are located below objective lens. Now, the final magnification as we have discussed, it could be from 1000 to maybe million times of the image and it could be varied by again altering current in projector lenses. So, like I said, there are sufficient details present in the image from the objective to magnify it many folds to get information unlike light microscopy. There are objective apertures below a specimen which eliminates the electrons that have been elastically scattered. Generally, apertures of around 30 to 50 micrometer in diameter are utilized. There are stigmators like I said, objective stigmators are special types of lenses and which are used to compensate for certain imperfections which are present in the construction and alignment of the column and we are not going in detail of those. Uh, lenses here. So, these are part of the imaging systems or we call it optics. Now, image observation and recording. Now, images can be viewed on a screen like finally, projector lens will focus the magnified image onto the uh, fluorescent screen which could be light emitting phosphor or fluorescent surface. A screen can be observed directly or for increased magnification you can uh, and critical focusing you can observe it through binocular microscope. Now, images is recorded on sheet film and camera mechanism located beneath the screen. A video camera can be used or a charge coupled device could be used uh, to record digital images that can be used uh, to be stored in magnetic or optical storage uh, media. Now, computers can be employed for viewing image uh, and processing and analysis of it that makes it much more convenient to uh, process these image and analyze them. So, this was about image observation and recording. Now, after uh, like we have discussed about the various components, one major aspect of the electron microscope microscopy technique is the specimen preparation. Now, why it is so important? Now, the scattering of electrons by specimen component of specimen uh, is proportional to the matter present or we call it mass thickness or atomic density we call it. That is a measure of number of atoms per unit area and their atomic density. What does that mean? To understand this, if we see biological materials are mainly made up of atoms of relatively low atomic number like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen etcetera. Now, these are therefore, not effective scatterers of electrons because they have relatively less atomic density. So, mass thickness or atomic density of a specimen has needs to be enhanced and how to enhance them by fixing and staining the samples with solutions of heavy metals, so that you can get much heavier metals to diffract or scatter the electrons and to obtain the contrast. Unless you can obtain the contrast, you know that you cannot see the images. Now, they bind these heavy metals, they bind differentially to different components of the specimen and parts which, com uh, with, which uh, complexes with metal atoms. Uh, will not allow the passage of electrons. So, wherever there is a concentration of heavy metals, what will happen? The electrons will not pass through. Whereas, other parts where the electrons or heavy metals are not there, they will allow the passage of the 
electrons that is transmission of electrons will be allowed to the screen. So, what will happen wherever the screen is hit by the electrons due to the passage through the specimen the areas will look bright, but wherever the electrons has not been allowed to pass through the areas on the fluorescent screen will dark and that is how the contrast will be created and the image formation in the electron microscope will take place. So, this requires that you have to prepare a specimen in order to uh, provide the scattering capacity. Now, here since it has to go through so much of uh, processing and like I said it is a vacuum system ultra high vacuum system is present in the electron microscope only non living specimens can be observed in here and uh, so uh, except for certain environmental microscopes where uh, they allow partially hydrated samples where the uh, uh, vacuum conditions is around 10 raised to power minus 2 torr. So, but otherwise in high vacuum conditions the hydrated samples and therefore, the living samples are not allowed. Another thing is that thickness of a specimen for transmission electron microscopy must be less than 100 or 200 nanometer because of poor penetrating power of electrons. So, this is much, much more thinner than light microscopy uh, sections. Now, various methods of specimen preparation in TEM for introducing contrast are discussed in this uh, as we go along we will discuss about various ways to create contrast. So, let us see the first method. Now, if you could recall the specimen preparation in uh, light microscopy involved fixation, dehydration, embedding and sectioning and likewise here also the, the uh, we follow the same uh, steps here, but with certain differences. Now, first is the fixation. Now, for optimum preservation of organelles and membrane structures a strong protein cross linker is used or fixative use such, such as glutaraldehyde. Now, glutaraldehyde is a strong cross linker. If you would like to retain some amount of biological activity like antigenicity or so a weak cross linker such as para formaldehyde may be used. Now, samples which are used for morphological studies may routinely be post fixed that is you have fixed it with certain fixatives, but you can post fix with osmium tetroxide OSO3. Uh, what it does one thing it is a heavy metal another is it will cross link certain things like this uh, highly reactive metal oxide will predominant dominantly react with unsaturated lipids and uh, it will provide electron density uh, imparts the atomic density or electron density to biological membranes. It also reacts with proteins, lipoproteins, nucleic acids and other things. So, this will this can be used after fixation then potassium ferry or ferrocyanide can also be added to increase the membrane contrast uh, and there are a lot of other things which could be uh, like used. Now, after fixation many times samples may be treated with solutions of heavy metals. Now, this is not a staining still it is like you just after staining you are doing it is like you are trying to provide more and more atomic density for scattering and this is not compulsory here. Now, uranyl acetate and lead aspartate plus bismuth subnitrate can be used as block staining reagents. Uh, uh, here. So, after fixation the embedding is done. Now, first thing you have to do is in embedding is first you have to dehydrate the samples because many of these resins which are going to be uh, utilized are water, water immiscible. So, the most widely used are epoxy resins. In addition to epoxide like epon or epon substitutes which are used there are other uh, substitutes are all there uh, for enhancing uh, the reaction or for hardness they are utilized like for example, anhydrides like nadic methyl anhydride called NMA and do decenyl succinic anhydride DDSA are uh, added to uh, uh, resin to modify its hardness. 
also an accelerator like DMP30 could be utilized to speed up the polymerization. Uh, so, there are, these are other additives which can be used for enhancing the uh, polymerization and to control its hardness. And like I said, this has to be done, uh, uh, dehydration has to be done before we start that. And this could be done in similar way as it has been done by a series of ethanol water and finally, absolute ethanol. And here, uh, uh, propylene oxide is generally used as a transition solvent. So, there could be other resins which are uh, their names, commercial names are LR white or LR gold uh, could be used and these have low viscosity and they are acrylic resins and could be used for post embedding for immunocytochemistry. So, these are other applications uh, and these could be used for embedding. Once it is embedded and hardened, then sectioning is done. Now, in sectioning if you see, uh, if you could recall a micro tome was utilized in light microscopy, but here you need much thinner sections. So, here an ultra micro tome is used to prepare sections from 50 nanometer or less to 1, mic 1 to 2 micrometer in thickness. Now, sections are cut by either glass knives or diamond knives in particular and these sections float off the edge of the knife onto the water trough, water held in a trough behind the edge. Now, these floating sections are collected onto a specimen support. I will show you that here. Uh, for staining and examination in time. Now, a specimen support is a uh, grid which is called a specimen grid or a, around 3.05 millimeter in diameter made of fine metal mesh, usually copper and can be other metals with openings in metal varying from 450 to 20 micrometer. Uh, in case of acrylic resins, the grid is first covered with thin plastic films and section collected on a supporting film. I will summarize this whole thing a little later. Then staining. So, we have done like if you could recall after we have done post fixation, there was ospium tetroxide and then also block staining reagents were used, but still after the embedding and uh, cutting thin sections again staining is done to impart more scattering power. Now, the sections require additional staining with solutions of heavy metal to further increase the contrast. Now, the two most widely used stains are uranyl acetate, it is used in acidic conditions and there is a lead citrate which is in basic conditions. Now, this will give uh, uranyl acetate gives uh, mostly uh, gives contrast to nucleic acids and lead uh, citrate could be utilized for contrast of glycogen and ribonucleoproteins, etcetera. Now, staining times could range from anywhere from 1 to 10 minutes and then different section could be thoroughly rinsed in distilled water and then can be dried and can be used for observation under electron microscopy. So, all right. So, this was the extensive specimen preparation in the electron microscopy which is transmission electron microscopy. There are other methods of creating contrast as we go along we will discuss that, but first we should summarize whatever we have uh, uh, the specimen preparation and so I would like you to focus on your screen here. All right. So, Till now what we have discussed about transmission electron microscopy, various components and let us summarize how specimen preparation is done. So, first thing is you will dissect or get the tissues or whatever sample you have and then that sample has to be, if I say that particular sample needs to be uh, uh, the fixation has to be done. Now, fixation in that sample will be done by so you have material in here and this is the fixation solution. Now, fixation solution like, like I said could be anything, it could be simple paraformaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. Now, once you have done this, 
the fixation solution you will remove this and you will uh, you have to uh, wash it you will do washing and you will remove any uh, after fixation this step has to be carried on now after that the most important part is you have to go along uh, uh, dehydration step. So, a series of ethanol water and finally, finally the absolute ethanol will be utilized to absolute ethanol and then propylene oxide will be utilized for, uh, for transition as a transition solvent. Now, once you have done that then what we have to go about is the this particular thing has to be embedded. So, for embedding there will be there will be embedding solution here and tissue will be kept in the embedding solution. This could be a thick section or otherwise and this what will happen this embedding solution will be epoxy resins. Now, this embedding solution will be then uh, put into the oven for drying and once it is dried then it will be taken up into a Appendorf tube or whichever uh, is present in here. Now, once this is hardened this part could be cut by a scalpel or razor and what you will get is you will get only this part here which will be present in here. So, this could be then taken to ultra microtome. So, ultra microtome as we have seen earlier it could be a simply a arm here and this material which is here will be put on here there will be a, a blade or a diamond knife Uh, or a glass blade could be utilized. Now, this one has a property that it will give much ult higher ultra thin sections like I said than the simple microtome. So, this is ultra microtome because and this is placed in cold conditions. Uh, it could be placed in cold conditions if uh, certain uh, cryo techniques has to be used that we will discuss later on. Now, as this is a water trough here as the sections are cut in here these section will fall off onto the water trough from the edge of the knife and then these could be picked up by the uh, a specimen holder. Now, this specimen holder which is a specimen grid will be a circular 3.05 millimeter grid with a mesh of copper or some other metal it looks something like this which has a mesh size and a specimen will be put in at these mesh and this will have a holder here. Now, this could be placed in this uh, once these are again stained in here and once these are stained and dried and then finally, rinsed with distilled water they could be placed into the electron microscope for viewing. So, that is how the whole thing works. So, I hope uh, uh, you, you have been able to understand uh, this whole specimen preparation. So, uh, it is like you fix it, then you dehydrate it, then you uh, uh, like uh, make sections and finally, uh, you stain it uh, on the specimen grid and you insert it for viewing on in the electron microscope. Uh, it could be side entry or top entry device. So, uh, uh, this in this lecture we will stop here. In summary what we have discussed in here is the different uh, components of electron microscopes, the basic differences between the light microscope and electron microscope like you have advantages at, as well as disadvantages. Particularly you have advantage of resolution in electron microscope over light microscope and 
but you have disadvantage of uh, you cannot use live cells as you can do in many techniques of light microscopy. Uh, in the next lecture, we will continue discussing about the various other methods to create contrast in transmission electron microscopy as well as we are going to discuss about the scanning electron microscopy. Thank you.